All right, it is 12 o'clock, so I will go ahead and hand it to Eve Nelson to get us started here. Super, thank you, Christy. Um, I just want to extend a really uh, warm welcome. Thanks so much for joining our, our next series around medical complexity. Um, we're really excited at this uh, partnership with our caregivers and our medical complexity clinical teams. Um, just really um, so much great information to share with one another. Um, I was just reminded today, you know, this the snowy days really thrown a curveball for many parents and caregivers. Um, and I think this, what we're talking about is how do we uh, support caregivers, you know, with uh, the many curveballs that get thrown um, every day. So um, I want to just uh, give a few house cleaning reminders. Your microphones have been muted, but we'd really love to hear from you. So please do unmute or talk to, uh, type in the chat. Uh, we love your questions and comments. Um, when possible, we really appreciate it if you can keep your camera on and help us create that community of learning. Um, we appreciate if you can type in your first and last names. That really helps us make sure we get the certificates of attendance um, out to you. Uh, just a reminder that we will be recording the sessions today. Um, just uh, we'll be recording the didactic component, but we won't be recording uh, the parent uh, panel and discussion. So with that, I'm really pleased to hand it off to our presenters, um, Dr. Dana Bakula and Nicole Crump. So um, again, so excited to hear your content. Thank you. Um, so I am Dana Bakula. I'm a pediatric psychologist at Children's Mercy um, and an assistant professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. I uh, specialize in working with children with medical complexity and currently work in the pediatric feeding program at Children's Mercy, but then I also specialize um, and do a lot of research and clinical work around supporting the needs of caregivers of children with medical conditions. So that's kind of the lens that I approach uh, our conversation with today. And I am really excited, as Evelyn said, this is our third echo in this series of working with children with medical complexity. So excited to talk about this from a caregiver support lens today. And Nicole, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Thanks, Dana. I'm Nicole Crump. I work at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City. I am housed within the Pediatrics Department, um, Division of Developmental and Behavioral Sciences. And specifically within that, the grant that I primarily support is Kansas Lend Leadership Education and Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities. And I'm here today partly for that and partly to offer a caregiver perspective. I'm the mom to a seven-year-old girl with a very rare and complex <clears throat> genetic disorder. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and I just also want to highlight how wonderful it is to have Nicole's professional expertise in this area, but also her lived experience, which is something we're really hoping to make sure that we highlight uh, very well in this session is, is really hearing from people with lived experience caregiving for children with medical complexity. Okay, with that, Christy, let's go into the next slide. So our agenda today is to provide an introduction and disclosures. We have a didactic presentation that is an introduction to this topic of understanding the well-being um, of caregivers of children with medical complexity. And then we have a panel discussion today where we have brought in two panelists that will speak from their own lived experiences as caregivers. And we really hope that you all might participate in that discussion, ask some questions, um, things like that. But we also have a few prepared discussions we can talk with, talk about during the panel. Next slide. We do not have any relevant financial disclosures to share. Next slide. Um, and after the session, so uh, like Dr. Nelson mentioned, the slides um, and the recording will be sent to you. The recording will be of the didactic portion today. We have certificates of attendance that will be sent out after the series concludes. And if you have any questions you didn't get answered during the session today, you can send them to telehealthrocks at kumc.edu. You can also send questions in the chat as we're talking, um, and then we'll have periods for questions throughout as well. Next slide. 
So just a brief introduction to children with medical complexity. As I mentioned, this is the third series that we've done on children with medical complexity, and, and this one is specifically focused on supporting caregivers and their own well-being. So children with, and youth with special health care needs comprise about 20% of the United States, and these are children who have or it are or are at increased risk for chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional conditions, and also require health and related services of a type or amount that are beyond that required by children generally. Um, and then there's also this subcategory within children with special health care needs uh, that we identify as children with medical complexity. So those are children with substantial um, family identified service needs, uh, diagnosed with significant chronic conditions, they have high healthcare utilization, and often have pretty significant functional limitations. Uh, for the purpose of this session, we'll kind of talk about both of them together, not just children with medical complexity, because I think this is really broadly applicable information to parents of children with lots of different types of medical conditions and a range of different um, levels of functioning, but we'll also really keep that children with medical complexity piece in mind. Next slide. And I want to orient us all today to why we're talking about caregiver well-being, um, parent and caregiver well-being for children with medical complexity. This is a, a model that we use a lot when thinking about the health and well-being of individuals. It's called an ecological systems theory. And it says that all individuals are surrounded by lots of different systems, and those systems influence um, their health, their well-being, uh, their psychosocial health as well. And we see that for children, right, they're at the center of the circle, but then they're surrounded by families and health services and schools. And then as you go further out, there's also neighborhoods and social services and the culture that they live in, things like that all influence them. But these individuals in the really close part of that system have a really large um, sphere of influence around an individual's life. And parents and caregivers specifically have a lot of influence on the health and well-being of children and vice versa. Um, children have a lot of influence on their parents. And so we know that these two things are very strongly related. Next slide. Um, we sent out some surveys to all of you. So thank you so much to all of you who replied. We got a lot of really great replies. So I was really excited about that and gives us a little bit of a baseline of what you all kind of feel comfortable and familiar with regarding caregiver well-being. So I just wanted to review those with you today. So it looked like when asking about are there parents and caregivers where you felt concerned about their well-being, the majority of you all said yes. Um, so maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe you've seen parents where you have had some concerns about how they're doing their own coping, things like that. So hopefully um, that has been something that's motivated you to be here today. Um, we asked how comfortable you feel asking parents and caregivers about their own well-being. And quite a few of you said very comfortable, which was exciting to see a lot of people in that somewhat comfortable area. So hopefully that's something that we can change um, and help you feel more comfortable. And then when asking about how confident you felt that you could point parents and caregivers um, of children with medical complexity in a direction when they're struggling, that's where people felt a lot less confident um, or somewhat confident. And so it seems like that understanding of resources where to support families is an area for future support. So that's hopefully something we can also address in this ECHO series. Next slide. Um, before talking specifically about parent and caregiver well-being in the context of medical complexity, I also just want to orient us all to parent and caregiver well-being in general. Um, I can also imagine that many of you have children home today during the snow day, so you might be acutely familiar with the stress of being a parent in general. Um, but we also just know that broadly the rates of mental health conditions are pretty substantial among U.S. adults. So one in five Americans has a mental health condition each year. And then when we look specifically into kind of parents and family systems, we see that one in 14 children have a parent with poor mental health. Um, and so really these things are quite prevalent um, among parents in general. Next slide. We also see that a lot of parents experience burnout um, in the US particularly. This was a study that was done prior to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic where they measured um, 
parental burnout in 42 countries around the world. And the United States was ranked in the highest um, criteria in terms of amount of parents experiencing burnout around the world. And again, we can only imagine how this might have been exacerbated since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Next slide. Um, this is data from the Rapid Survey Project, which is a project that began before the pandemic and they've been collecting data from parents and families throughout the course of the last um, almost three years. And they update their data almost monthly. They've used a variety of ways to get data, including Facebook and social media recruitment, as well as through some agencies and organizations that work closely with parents. But what's notable about this is since the pandemic started, parent stress has escalated quite a bit. So at the beginning, prior to the pandemic, we see that initial data point and then stress, loneliness, anxiety, depression, all escalated and they've kind of had some ups and downs. But if you look at the yellow line, which is parent stress, that really has not ever recovered back to baseline levels. And again, speaks to the stressors that parents and caregivers experience every day. Next slide. Um, so with that, I want to pass this over for a moment to Nicole, just to kind of talk from her experience as a parent, what it's been like over the last couple of years, what, what, what that is like experiencing some of these stressors as a caregiver. Yeah, thank you, Dana. Um, it's, like Dana mentioned, been really stressful experience for all parents, and I can speak to also having a neurotypical child that has come with its own set of challenges to be certain, but I think that it is profoundly different when parenting a complex child over the last few years. Um, I think the first noticeable thing was that we lost all of the hope that we had relied upon for years, just completely lost it overnight. And it's been a years long process of trying to replace it. And we have never gotten back to baseline. So trying to rapidly adapt to providing full scale nursing care for someone that you know how to do, but you had been reliant on others to provide for quite some time was a huge shift and really difficult to grapple with. Um, I had to drastically reduce my work hours, cut them in half which led to a significant loss in income, which in turn led to a bunch of different stresses within our home and within the relationship. Uh, its sense of self changed completely as I had to completely shift sort of our work-life balance priorities. Everything, of course, went virtual, including her therapies, which I was deeply underqualified to perform at home. I felt like I was failing constantly. I didn't feel like I was adequate for her needs and that she was regressing and that it was my fault. I was really dealing with that. Um, we eventually just stopped doing therapy because it didn't seem to make sense for us and we weren't getting anything out of it. And then that had its whole set of challenges. She had multiple surgeries over the last few years. I have never seen any of her surgeons' faces. She has had lengthy, multiple hospital stays. I have never seen the full faces of any of the staff who has cared for her. That really diminishes my trust in the system. It increases my anxiety surrounding all of those procedures. That's just been a tremendously bizarre thing to deal with. And then just the extreme isolation that accompanies, um, you know, this very prolonged period of time in which you don't feel comfortable sort of re-entering society and getting back to that baseline of things. Like people went back to back to normal a lot quicker than we had the option to for safety reasons. And so then with that, you're just you're stuck. It feels no one under feels like no one understands you. I feel resentful, um, hurt, like jealous. And so grappling with all of those emotions and then also not really having the time to even tend to my own emotional health throughout all of that because it's completely without fan support. So it's been hard. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Next slide, Christy. Um, so then to dive in even to some of these things Nicole just mentioned, but to to think about all of this now in the context of parents and caregivers of children with medical complexity and medical conditions, we see that parents are juggling a lot of demands. They're keeping a lot of balls in the air at all times. So you're balancing, you know, the parents are balancing medical appointments, medications, um, advocacy for their child, accessible transportation, medical technology, their child's school needs, respite needs, but also in the meantime, still juggling jobs, other children that they might have, um, marital and family relationships, bills, caring for their family members, household chores, their own medical needs or expenses. So there are a lot of um, a lot of things that add to the complexity of a parent or caregiver's life when they are navigating these demands. Next slide. 
So to speak to that, um, again, my daughter requires full-time one-on-one support. And in, in offering her that, I often feel like I'm completely neglecting the needs of my other child who needs a lot of emotional support and understanding and patience and flexibility. Um, that is just really- Can you speak a little closer to your microphone? Sorry. Sure, sorry about that. Um, basically, I, I'll repeat really briefly. My daughter requires full-time one-on-one support. And so in providing that for her, it's been really difficult to fulfill my other child's needs. And he has kind of his own set of things going on that I don't feel like I can adequately address. So that's been really challenging. Um, I often feel like I'm failing, like I'm drowning, like I have absolutely no sense of balance as I try to accomplish everything. I have no off switch as I juggle a career that I care deeply about and that I want to pursue various goals in. And then this incessant stream of texts and calls and emails from related to Mira's care. There's just no, no comfortable way to toggle between those. I'm her full-time case manager and I'm also um, an employee for a large university that I want to do a good job at. It's incredibly difficult to find respite and it's always kind of this answer like, well, if we just had the care, if we just had somebody to come over. But within that, it's typically one individual seeking that, advertising for it, hiring individuals, training the individuals, allowing them that, you know, being vulnerable, vulnerable enough to allow them into your home and get to know your family and be in your space, do all of those things, and then ultimately lose that person and start the process all over again. So nothing is quite as easy as it seems. Um, Unfortunately, romantic relationships typically come last on the list. And so that's been challenging to be intentional about devoting enough of ourselves to one another so we can maintain strength and unity throughout this really difficult journey. Our house is a disaster all the time. Um, I am the sole, with the exception of the school bus, which was started last year, I'm the sole transporter of my child. So I have a wheelchair van and I have to always be available in that regard. Um, It really dictates when I'm in and out of my own home, when I can work, all of those things. Um, constantly thinking about our home and the adaptations we have to make and do we have enough space and what does she need and what do I need to get next? But also we don't have enough money to do those things and get the bigger house and do the next adaptation. And I know that I could potentially get Medicaid funding for that, but that could be a year and a half before I get it. So is it easier to just pay out of pocket? So always making those decisions. Um, I mentioned meals in the previous slide. No one in my home, my husband and I can eat the same, but she has a very specific way that she needs to eat. My son has a very specific way that he needs to eat. It's just this constant running to-do list of managing everybody's needs and expectations. And often mine go um, unmet or undermet. I'll say, um, I fill 98 syringes of meds a week. Um, At a recent appointment for myself, it was my first physical in two years. I forgot my own birthday because I was so accustomed to spouting out all of her information. And then There was also a mention of medical bills and things. I just got a bill for a miscarriage I had a year ago. I have unpaid medical bills for myself. Um, I had to recently go back on antidepressants and have that conversation. So it's just, there's never, it's not smooth sailing ever. Um, There is no real sense of balance when you're dealing with this level of complexity. Thanks for sharing all of that, Nicole. And I I know someone mentioned in the chat, thanks for sharing with such openness and honesty. many of us think, but never say out loud. So I appreciate your vulnerability a lot having these discussions. Um, Okay, next slide, Christy. Um, So what we know from a lot of research that's occurred over the past 30, 40 years is that parents uh, and caregivers of children with medical conditions and medical complexity have higher rates of depressive symptoms, anxious symptoms, post-traumatic stress disorder, Um, and parenting stress. And so we see that there is a very clear um, body of literature that says that these parents are struggling quite a bit more than parents of kids without medical conditions or without this added layer of complexity. And so it really speaks to uh, this huge underserved need that we really need to find a way to better support parents and caregivers. Because often in our settings in pediatric um, hospitals or in schools or in, in other settings, we're often there to care for and take care of the child. That's often how most of us meet and interact with parents 
and caregivers of children with medical complexity. Um, and so we don't often think about the parent or the caregiver and their own well-being and their own need, but we see that there is a huge and tremendous need here um, because these parents experience a lot more of these struggles. Next slide. Um, and when we look at the literature and what it says about, um, you know, what puts parents or caregivers at more risk for mental health concerns or, or other types of concerns related to their own well-being, we see that parents are more likely to struggle if they're a single parent, if they had pre-existing mental health concerns, if they don't have a large social support system, if there aren't a lot of people there in their corner helping them. Um, women more than men are prone to experiencing these concerns. Um, if the child has more emotional or behavioral problems, parents of younger kids and families with less socioeconomic resources like financial resources, insurance, et cetera. Next slide. And we also see, as I alluded to in the beginning, when looking at that big circle model with um, thinking about how parents and children are very connected, the literature is very clear that when parents experience more anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, parenting stress, their children experience more of these similar types of issues and their children's health-related quality of life is lower. Um, so we see this really direct relationship between these two things, adding to the importance of, of our role in supporting parents and caregivers that we interact with. Next slide. And I wanna pass this back over to Nicole again, um, just to share about the stress um, that specifically comes with having a child with medical condition, but also I know Nicole wants to touch on some of that medical trauma piece, because I mentioned that post-traumatic stress disorder is a bit higher um, for parents of children with medical complexity. And I think that's something we talk a little bit less about, but there is a lot of medical trauma that can go along with having a child with a medical condition. Yeah, thanks, Dana. And it's not something that I even really believed, I guess, until I experienced it for myself. I had heard studies that the PTSD experienced by caregivers of complex children can mimic that of soldiers. And I thought there's absolutely no way. But I think after having lived through some of the most um, daunting experiences in my life the last few years, it's absolutely true. I think what I want to make sure people understand is that for a lot of us living this life there's absolutely no ability to predict when an emergency will happen and so we're constantly in this fight or flight mode we don't get to ever really settle into a level of comfort that most families experience with the baseline assumption that your kids will be safe and healthy or even alive um we witness things that most non-medical professionals are lucky enough to never witness over the course of an entire lifetime or if they do it certainly isn't with a small child or their own child um, there are still certain sounds, words, descriptors for my child that are very triggering to me that will put me immediately into a space where I am not very conversational. I kind of shut down. I don't want to hear that. Or I'm just so anxious and physically elevated that I need to leave the space. Um, all of that also has affected my relationship with my child. And so I get worried that I people pick up on that sometimes. And the way that I speak to her and the way that I interact with her is all often kind of dictated by what I've just been through with her. And so just, I would love to encourage empathy and understanding in that sometimes it's my relationship with her is so much out of just like medical necessity. And I'm, she's almost my patient, but sometimes that mother child bond that is very warm and loving and wonderful, it might um, be the less important thing in that moment, rather than just like keeping her alive and well. It affects relationship with family members um, where a lot of us deal with something called anticipatory grief, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but that constant state of, well, I know she's not gone yet, but I know that she will be. And when is that going to happen? And what am I going to do? And how am I going to prepare? And living with that day in, day out is just, I, I can't even begin to describe what that feels like. So with all of that being said, some of us don't have the healthiest coping mechanisms. I will readily admit in the spirit of honesty and vulnerability that I drink more than I should, that I don't always take care of myself. I don't sleep well. I know all of the things that I should be doing and the reality of making those happen and fitting them into my life and adapting all of my habits is really challenging when you are in this fight or flight mode. Um, we're also a lot of us used to being these strong advocates constantly fighting for what we need. And so I tend to approach IEP meetings and con difficult conversations with sort of this attitude of like, you're not gonna listen. And so I'm, got, I'm ready with my guns out. And that's not always the case, but I think understanding that that might be how 
parents tend to approach some of these conversations is important. Um, I also think just noticing things like if parents seem like they're neglecting some of their responsibilities or aren't following through on them some of the suggestions that you made to implement with your child at home, they have trouble concentrating within a conversation that you're having, or they seem really irritable or they're overreacting. A lot of those are trauma responses that are not just personality flaws or they're not just having a bad day. They are often trauma responses. So I think I would just want you to come away with assuming that baseline stress for a parent like me is just a lot, a lot higher than parents of my child of my child's peers. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, next slide, Christy. Um, so as mentioned, we want to make sure that we share a lot of resources with you throughout this series because I think those resources for parents and caregivers have been harder to come by or harder to know where they are. Um, all of these uh, will be sent after the session compiled together, so no need to frantically write down any of these. Um, but we have compiled quite a few different online resources um, that I myself and Nicole and others regularly point families to as a source of um, finding additional support um, for themselves. Next slide. We also have compiled a list of different videos and podcasts that are by parents or other parents of children with medical complexity or medical conditions um, that uh, shares some perspective on what it's like to be a parent or caregiver in this uh, situation. And I know Nicole has a lot more of these too that she has compiled over time. So we're also hoping to compile um, even a larger list than this and share those with you throughout the course of this echo. So more to come on this topic. Next slide. Um, this is a list of some books that we found to be helpful in sharing with parents and caregivers that provide some, some good tips and tricks for managing this complicated um, journey of parenting a child with a chronic medical condition. Next slide. Um, we also, again, we'll share the link for this. The, this is a handout that can be shared with families um, about how to find a therapist for themselves when you're a parent or a caregiver of a child with a medical condition. Um, our healthcare system is anything but simple. And so it is already challenging to know how to find a therapist um, for anyone, but then to think about how to find a therapist that can understand and um, provide good support to you when you're parenting a child with um, medical complexity is even more challenging. And so this is just a resource that can be shared with families about how to go about finding their own therapist. Next slide. Um, and then we've compiled some local resources for Kansas and Missouri, different sources of support that exist locally. Um, I think first and foremost, one of the best resources can be asking the um, child's care team. So having the families talk to the care team, if there's a social worker or someone else on the team who might be able to point them to some local resources um, that are uh, dependent on that kind of local community um, or county, et cetera, as well as pointing parents to their own healthcare providers, like their own um, primary care doctor to ask about available supports. But then we have other ones listed here. 